بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين حمدا يوافي نعمه يكافي مزيدا يا ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك ولعظيم سلطانك سبحانك لا نحصي ثناء عليك انت كما اثنيت على نفسك فلك الحمد حتى ترضى ولك الحمد اذا رضيت ولك الحمد بعد الرضا اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد في الاولين وصلي وسلم على سيدنا محمد في الاخرين وصلي وسلم على سيدنا محمد في كل وقت وحين وصلي وسلم على سيدنا محمد في الملا العلى الى يوم الدين وصلي وسلم على سيدنا محمد حتى تذل الارض ومن عليها انت خير الوارثين نويت تعلم التعليم وتذكر التذكير النفع انتفاع والافاده والاستفاده والحث على التمسك بكتاب الله وبسنه رسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم ودعاء الهدى ودلاله على الخير ابتغاء وجه الله ومرضاته وقربه وثوابه سبحانه وتعالى We now begin, inshallah, uh, an overlook at the third chapter inside of Imam Busayri's um, Burda radiallahu ta'ala anhu warda. The chapter is upon praising the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahi wa sallam. Uh, the word employed for praise ordinarily is the word madh, madh. And this is madh al-rasul sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahi wa sallam. Although the more correct term for praise in the language of the Arabs is the word alhamd, alhamd. By virtue of the declaration of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, alhamdulillah, that alhamd is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ulama, having adab with Allah ta'ala, having etiquette with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they prefer the term, and it's somewhat and it's synonymous term, madh, as opposed to hamd for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. Although the word and it madh, it implies the word hamd. And it, being in the language of the Arabs, that the word hamd in the language of the Arabs, it is a word that you use in order to extol that which is beautiful by virtue of its own volition. And that which chooses to be beautiful, not that which is innately beautiful. That's the word hamd, ordinarily it's employed in the language of the Arabs. As opposed to the word medh. The word medh is a word for that which is not beautiful by its own volition, but it was created that way. But when we're going to speak about and Imam Busayri rahimahullah ta'ala is going to speak about any praise of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi there are sort of three reasons why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi is being praised. And the first and the most foremost that Imam Busayri rahimahullah ta'ala brings for the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam annahu jameelun ikhtiyariyun that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi is beautiful by choice sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We're not speaking about his innate beauty. But the fact that the Prophet وسلم, he behaves in a beautiful manner, in a way that is deemed beautiful by the Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so in that sense, the word madh is what is synonymous for the term hamd. hamd. And that term also has currency for the Prophet وسلم, Why? Because he is Muhammad وسلم, by name. And his name Muhammad, it's taken from the term hamd in the Arabic language. And as we know inside the, the narrative of the grandfather of the Prophet وسلم, Abdul Muttalib ibn Hashim, that when he was asked, why are you calling the boy by a name that is not born by any of your forefathers? I None of your forefathers carry that name. Nor is it a name that has currency amongst what Quraysh, his tribe, his greater tribe. And Abdul Muttalib, he then says these immortal words, Rujuwan a yuhmadu fil ardi wa sama, in the hope that he will be praised Upon earth as well as in the heavens. Rujuwan and Yuhmad, Yuhmad Ham, that he is praised upon earth as well as in the heavens. Khalas, Kalam, Nafid, the words of Abdul Muttalib, and he had been born inside of creation. So that the Prophet is praised upon earth. To this day and beyond this day, he's praised upon earth. And the Prophet ﷺ, from the very inception of the heavens, the Prophet ﷺ was praised. He is Muhammad ﷺ. His name Muhammad ﷺ does not only allude to praise, but it also alludes to intense praise. His name is not Mahmud. His name is Muhammad. Mahmud is the one who is praised. But Muhammad is the one who is the object of intense and perennial praise sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam by virtue of what character traits that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam either has innately, ay khuliq hakada, Allah ta'ala created him in that way 
all, also likewise by virtue of the fact that the Prophet وسلم, displays praiseworthy characteristics that are beyond his innate nature. So this is the chapter upon the Madh of the Messenger of Allah. And Imam al-Busayri rahimahullah ta'ala has not did it justice, albeit this is one of the longest fusul, longest chapters inside of the Burda. He's not did it justice, 30 lines. And obviously we're going to have an element of struggle tonight to try and yeah, they go through the 30 lines of praise of the Prophet Sallallahu but the Prophet Sallallahu cannot be praised in 30 lines. And he not, cannot be praised in 300 or 3,000 or 3 million or 3 billion or 3 trillion lines. He cannot be praised Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The only one who can praise the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah Jalla Jalalu wa ta'ala 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 as Ibn al-Farid rahimahullah ta'ala says, Allah ta'ala is the one who praises the Prophet sallallahu in that which is his due right. That's why one of them, they saw Ibn al-Farid rahmatullah ta'ala alayhi ba'da mawti, after he had died, Ibn al-Farid, one of the great sort of um, poets of this Islamic tradition. And of the strange things like Ibn al-Farid, they say rahimahullah ta'ala, like al-Rumi rahimahullah ta'ala, the strangest things you find in these great poets of Islam is that they don't take to praise of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi and it, why didn't Ibn al-Farid praise the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And he dedicated his poetry to praising the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why didn't Jalal al-Din al-Rumi, rahmatullah ta'ala alayhi, the great poets of Islam, dedicate his poetry to praising the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And in a version they mentioned about Ibn al-Farid, Ru'i ba'da mawtid, that he was seen after his death and he was asked, why didn't you spend your time praising the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Alayhi wa and he said, arra kullu madhin fi nabi muqassira. He said, because I see that any praise of the Prophet وسلم, any praise of the Prophet وسلم, is deficient. That every praise of the Prophet وسلم, is deficient by its essential nature. Why? Because it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who took it upon himself to praise his beloved. What he begins with radiallahu anhu warda are those great qualities that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam displays due to his own volition. Because the ultimate reason why he is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, why he is praised, the object of intense praise inside of this world sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inside of the next world sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is because he is the supreme praiser of Allah. That nobody praises Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala, like the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. Yani every single quanta atom of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is dedicated to praising the Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the face that Imam Busayri, rahimahullah ta'ala, wants to engage. Dhanam tu sunnata man ahya dhalam. That I have wronged the example of him who revived the nights and he brought light to what? To these dark nights, to darkness. Until his wa, his feet complained due to praying of painful swelling. Sallallahu alayhi wa Ma'roof with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi And his days were dedicated to praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And fasting for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَجَاهَدْتَ فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِ Or as the Sahaba said, and you struggled in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala supreme and a true struggle, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallam. That's how his days were. And likewise how his nights were, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sallam. Spent praising the Messenger of Allah, praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And those first and foremost, and our praise of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sallam, our praise is not qawli. Our praise, what Imam al-Busayri rahimahullah ta'ala is alluding to, our praise is not just verbal, but our praise must be actual, must be practical, the nature of the praise of the believer of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa I.e. you praise the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa by being as close to him as possible, by imitating him as much as possible, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so otherwise, it's dhulm. You see, I've wronged myself, vulv in the Arabic language, is the, what is the antonym of sunnah. Yani when, the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, yani, يُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ That Allah ta'ala teaches, the, the Prophet وسلم, teaches the book and he teaches wisdom. What is wisdom? The ulama radiallahu anhu wa say, wisdom is the sunnah of the Prophet 
And wisdom, by definition, it means to put everything inside of its correct place. That's what wisdom means. Zulm in the Arabic language, al aks tamaman. It's the antonym of it. It means It means to put something in other than its designated place. And what Imam Busayri rahimahullah ta'ala in our last chapter was based upon the issue of the hawa, of this nafs al ammara bisu, of this self that commands the evil. And when it commands the evil, it's going to command to the antonym of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You need to deviate from his path. And so this is the first i'tiraf, acknowledgement of al-Busayri as it relates to the lower reality. Zalam to sunnata man ahya zalama. That I have what? I have oppressed. I have wronged the way of the one who brought life to darkness. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How does he bring life to darkness? By worshipping and praising his Lord. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is sort of definition based definition for many of us about what does it mean to be somebody who follows the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You'll hear the ulama, they'll use the term, employ the term Muhammadi. And what does it mean to be Muhammadi? And to be a Muhammadan in the English language. A Muhammadan is somebody yanfarid al-ibad lillahi jalla jalala wa ta'ala ta'adhamatu. It's somebody who was singles out Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for worship and for praise. That's Muhammadan. That's like Ibn Atayla al-Iskandari rahimahullah ta'ala. And he gives him one of his beautiful hikam that it's upon the slave, the slave, or slaves, the tahqiq, yani to realize al ubudiyya bondship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَإِذْهَارُ عِزَّةُ الرُّبُوبِيَّةِ And to manifest the might of lordship. And the slave, two realities for the slave, and this is the definition of the Muhammadan reality, is that you realize your slavehood, your bondsmanship in front of the Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. One. And number two is that thereby you become the loci for the manifestation of the might of the divine, of rububiyyah, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's definition of what? Of what Muhammadiyyah, of what the Muhammadan nature. And here what we see in Busayri, the first thing, and often the first is the most important, or maybe the last is the most important, when Imam Busayri, rahimahullah ta'ala, will speak about the fragrance of the actual soil, of the grave of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Either or, but first we begin with the first bait. And the first bait is about the ibadah, the worship of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A hadith, multiple a hadith. These are a hadith that you find in the tradition of Sayyidina Aisha, radiallahu anha, in the Sahih. Tradition that you find in the hadith in the Sahih of Sayyidina Mughayra ibn Shu'bah, radiallahu anhu, urda. Hadith that you find in Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik, multiple of the companions. Hadith that you find in Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu anhu, urda. Hadith that you find in Sayyidina Hudayf ibn Yaman, radiallahu anhu, urda. Yani a jilla from amongst the companions. Hadith that you find in Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas. These companions, radiallahu anhu, urda, they were companions who were privileged to what to see those quote unquote dark nights of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How we brought light to the midst of darkness Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How we brought life to those dead nights Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through worshiping his Lord. In a way that is unimaginable. And hatta tawarramat qadama in the hadith in the Sahih. Until as Imam Busayri employs from the hadith, until his feet complained of painful swelling. Tawarramat qadama. Due to tool al qiyam, due to the length at which the Prophet وسلم, would stand in prayer. Sayyidina Mughayr ibn Shu'bah, Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik, عنه, and Aisha, the great woman Aisha, عنها, وردها, they would say to the Prophet, وسلم, Why do you go to such extremes, such lengths, when Allah was subhanahu wa ta'ala, ghafar Allah, wa min dhambika wa ta'akhar. When Allah was subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven all of your past as well as your post quote unquote sins. And the Prophet ﷺ, he simply answers, Afala akuna abdan shakura. Should I not then be a grateful servant? A servant who's ever grateful for all of the ni'am, all of those blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon me. Remember, the meaning of sin for the prophets in general is not the meaning of sins for the non-prophets in general. Again, a sin for a prophet, by definition, is tarq al-afdal lil fadilah is when a prophet is given two choices by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Two choices. One choice is good, and the second choice is better. Okay, it's about good and better. And the prophet chooses that which is good. Okay, he's choosing that which is good as opposed to choosing that which, which is better. By theological definition, that's what we call a sin or a them of the prophets themselves. 
You see, so their sins are not like our sins. I mean, the sins of the awliya are not like our sins. And the hasanat al-abrar, sayyat al-maqarrabin, qa'idah they give us. That the, the good deeds of the righteous are the sins of the endeared. The good deeds of the righteous, those same deeds that are good for the righteous, they consider to be the sins of the endeared, the maqarrabin. فَكَيْفَ بِالْأَنْبِيَاءِ وَالنَّبِيِّينَ وَالْمُرْسَلِينَ And how then about those who are sort of beyond def definition, the prophets and the messengers themselves? And how about the one who is completely beyond definition, as Imam Busayri will allude to our prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahi wa sallam. And then we find also our mother Aisha radha anha wa radha brings greater definition to the choice of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. That the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam never was he faced with two options, the good and the better. Save that he took the easiest of the two. What does the easiest of the two mean? The one which is facilitated. What does it mean facilitated? By Allah. Jalla Jalalu Ta'ala The same woman would say Aisha, would say about the Prophet. What is it that I see? That your Lord, you said it. Your Lord. The one who you singled out for worship, Jalla Jalalu Ta'ala that he moves swiftly to confirm your choice. And the choice that you make, that's what muyassir means. Like the Prophet Sadam in Bukhari, Kullu muyassirin lima khuliqala. Everybody will find easy that which they were created for. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that this is the divine hand. Bayna usba'iyya rahman as in the hadith in the Mustad of Ahmed ibn Hanbal between the two fingers of the Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. The point what we're trying to say, the point we're trying to clarify, that the choices of the Prophet وسلم, are none but the choices of the Divine Himself. Okay? And that is praiseworthy. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And he would pray the entire night. Although we don't know that the Prophet prayed more than 11 rak'ah. Maximum, he would pray at night, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 11 rak'ah. 11 cycles of prayer say that those cycles were long long extremely long our prophet sallallahu alaihi at the first way he gives night life to the night sallallahu alaihi is by what is by calling upon the word of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the end of surah ali imran in the hadith in the sahih al bukhari with the prophet sallallahu alaihi the first way to it utas in abdullah ibn abbas says when he would wake up in the in the midst of the night sallallahu alaihi wasallam at the end of Ali Imran, inna fi khalq al-samawati al-ard wa akhtilaf al-layli wa al-nahar la ayatu li'ul al-albab. Verily in the what? In the creation. In fi khalq al-samawati al-ard, in the creation of the heavens and the earth. And the alternation of night and day, la ayatu li'ul al-albab. Are signs for people of sagacity, people of intelligence. Al-ladhinu yudhkuroon Allah ha qiyama wa qa'udan wa ala junubihim. And those who mention, remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala standing and sitting and upon their sides وَيَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ and they contemplate, they meditate over the creation of, of the heavens and the earth رَبَّنَا مَا خَلَقَتَ هَذَا بَعْتِلًا My Lord, you have not created this in vain. This has not been created in vain. Uh, Subhanaka. Glory be to you. Transcendent are you. لَقِينَ عَذَابَ النَّارِ Save us from the punishment of hell. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would begin إلى آخر آخر آيات until the end of Surah Ali Imran. That's how he begins his night. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was wiping the sleep out of his face. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He thereby take to his siwak. Siwak you'd always find with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Either beneath his pillow or behind his ear. Beneath his ear, you'd find his siwak. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he would cleanse his mouth, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahibu sallama. Abdullah bin Abbas said he would take to the shin. He would take to the actual water skin. Thereby he would make wudu, sallallahu alayhi wa sahibu sallama. And then he would enter into prayer. The beginning of his prayer is very brief. He would, he would recite Fatiha and Surah Al-Kafirun in the first rak'ah. And then in the second rak'ah he would recite the Fatiha and Surah Al-Ikhlas. Very brief the first two rak'ah. After that, khalas, you told him. And then the Prophet Sallallahu would pray. And nobody could stand alongside the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam save like Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu arda says, dhanantu dhanna saw bin Rasulillah. Until when I tried to stand next to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and pray in the midst of the night, I had a bad thought about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They asked Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, what was the bad thought you had the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He said, aratu an usallim wa ada'an nabi. I just wanted to say salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah and abandon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
And who can pray that long? Sayyidina Mughir ibn Shu'bar al-A'anhu warda'i said the Prophet would go into prayer and then he'd start with Surah Al-Baqarah. Faqarra mi'ata ayah. He'd recite 100 ayahs from Surah Al-Baqarah. He said there were not just 100 verses from Surah Al-Baqarah. He said never would the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam come uh, yani, or would cross a verse which was enticing towards good, a verse of bishara, of glad tidings, say that he would ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the bishara, for the good, the glad tidings, for paradise. Never would he come across a verse that was seeking refuge from hell, save that he would go into prayer, yatadarra ila Allah. He would plead with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for protection from the hellfire of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Never would he come across a verse of rahmah, a verse of mercy, say that he would desire and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that mercy. Look how the Prophet interacts with Kitab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is just in the first hundred ayahs of Baqarah. And then after the first hundred ayahs, the second hundred ayahs. Mughir ibn Shu'bah, he said he's going to do one hundred and finish. Then after the hundred, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, khalas, he'd finish and end the Baqarah. Then I think, khalas, end the Baqarah, la bud and yarka. He's going to bow at the end of Baqarah. Yashra' fi Ali Imran. Then he starts with Ali Imran. The entire Ali Imran. Then Yashra' fi Nisa. Then Surah Al Nisa. Entire Nisa. Yashra' fi Al Ma'ida. Then Ma'ida. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Kayf. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is one raka'ah. He's in. Note, Sayyidina Mughir ibn Shu'ba, when he describes the prayer, he doesn't finish. And where did the Prophet Sassam finish? He didn't tell us. He does khalas. And he's got too tired of even enumerating the verses the Prophet Sassam was reciting. Look at the same with Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, exact same thing. He, he doesn't tell us where the Prophet Sassam finishes. He gets to likewise, gets to Surah Al-Ma'idah, khalas. It doesn't tell us where the prayer finishes. Likewise, Sayyidina Hudayh ibn al-Yaman gets to Surah Al-Nisa, Al-Ma'idah, khalas. Doesn't tell us where the Prophet Sassam finishes. You want a glimpse of where the Prophet Sassam finishes inside of his prayer in the midst of the night? Undur in the Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan. Look at Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan, he would complete the entire Quran in a raka'ah. One raka'ah. Quran from beginning to end in one rakah say to Uthman ibn Affan. Min ayna akhav? Where did he take this reality from? And the one, as he says, Radiallahu anhu, lam tu sunnata min ahya al-dhalama. Yani I have wronged the sunnah of the one who has brought life to darkness. Uh, that's Muhammadi. Because these are standards that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is showing each and every single one of us. Note that once, Busayri will show us, once a sahaba is privy to a reality of the Prophet he hasn't seen the half of it. You haven't seen the reality. You just seen the, the surah, the bashar, the form, the outward manifestation. He now, as Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu anha wardaha, said that the Prophet would always and he display his least reality in front of the companions out of fear of making religion too difficult for them. So once a companion sees the Prophet Sallallahu in worship, you're seeing the least reality of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You don't know the half of it. Huh? Radiallahu anhum wardahum wa shadda min sha'ibin ahshahu wa tawa tahta al-hijarati kashhan mutrafal adami. Over his belly and soft skin, he placed a stone, tightening a belt over it to lessen the hunger pangs. What's the second thing he, Imam Busayri, brings? Zuhr. The abstinence of the Prophet Remember, the Prophet is going to declare the Habib of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. the Prophet And the nature of Muhabbat Allah. How do you earn the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? By rejecting and renouncing and abstaining from that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows disdain towards. Allah wa hiya dunya. Is that not the world in and of itself? Inna Allah ma nadhra ila dunya mundu an khalaqaha. That verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet says, has not gazed at the world since he created it. Not gazed at the world. Our Prophet said, if the dunya meant anything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah ta'ala ma saqa kafiran sharbat al ma, that Allah ta'ala would not allow a non believer to have a gulp of water, if the dunya meant anything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet said that the dunya with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it does not even equate to jinah al ba'udha, it doesn't even equate to the wing of a gnat. The wing of a mosquito it doesn't even equate to that. In the riwayah, the Qad Ayyad, Yahsubi rahimahullah ta'ala brings in the shifa that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala offers the entire dunya to the ba'udah. 
the entire world and what it contains. He offers it to the mosquito. And the mosquito asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in exchange for what, my Lord? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to the mosquito in exchange for one of your wings. And the mosquito says, well, if I, if, I, if I give you one of my wings, then how will I fly? And the mosquito preferred his wings over the entire dunya and what it contains. Akad the kalam of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What is the worth of the world? Remember context. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa only guides us to good. Only shows us good. Only manifests good. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa 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 and this is sort of important, this second reality that Imam Busayn brings from these acts that are beautiful due to the volition of the Prophet sallallahu it's one of the diseases of this ummah is that we have zalam to sunnah tamin ahya zalam. That we have wronged, we've oppressed his sunnah by taking to the will and thereby earning distance from Allah and distance from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Wa wa a companion asked the Prophet sallallahu wa sallam a very simple question. And how do I become beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and beloved to people? Remember, there's an irtibat, there's a connection between Allah's love of you and people's love of you. I mean, the true love of you. And a true love of a person is predicated upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love of that person. That's hadith sahih, wadih inside of al-Bukhari. Very clear hadith inside of al-Bukhari. Of how when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves a slave, the Prophet says, the end of the tradition, يُضَعْ لَهُ الْقَبُولِ فِي الْأَرْضِ That exception for that person is placed upon the face of planet Earth. People love him. And so the Prophet tells his companion, is had fi dunya يَحَبَّكَ Allah. Was had fi ma عِنْدَ النَّاسِ يُحَبَّكَ nas. Renounce, reject the world, and Allah will love you. And renounce and reject what people possess, which is the world, and people likewise will love you. And that's the maqam of zuhud, the maqam of abstinence. It's one of these great darajat of yaqeen, great sort of stations of certainty. And the Prophet who's the Habib and the nature of the Habib, the one who's the object of love, because the word Habib here, it's the, it's the Hab, it's the one who loves the divine, but it's also the Mahboob, the one who's loved by the divine, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of the reasons that he's loved, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that he, yani, yatakallam, wa ya'bud, he speaks and he worships from the station of absolute certainty in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what they call yaqeen. And so when we speak about the Prophet Sassam's nights, what are the nature of his worship by nights? What does he define it as sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He defines it as the maqam of shukr, gratitude. Afala akuna abdan shakura? Should I not be a slave, slave who is forever grateful? وَقَلِيلُ مِنْ عِبَادِيَ shakur, As Allah Ta'ala says, very few of my slaves are shakur, are forever grateful. That's maqam, shukr. It's a high degree. And you can't be a person of shukr unless you're a person of sabr. As we know inside of the world of spirituality, two wings by which the believer ascends to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sabr and shukr. And necessary. One is predicated upon the other. And then in the second verse, the Prophet ﷺ is now what? ﷺ maqam zuhud. This is the maqam of abstinence, of rejection of the world. ﷺ. Remember, every single misdeed you do in your life is because of your inclination towards the world. Hubbi dunya ratkul he says. Your love of the world, ratkul khatiya, is the chieftain of every misdeed, or as we would say in English, the root of all evil is the love of the world. The Prophet says. And so he shows us how to reject the will That's the station of zuhud or abstinence. Again, nobody can be somebody of abstinence save that they're also somebody of tawakkul fillah. That's the other wing of zuhud. The opposite wing of zuhud is tawakkul. Okay, they're people of what? Of reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that is uncanny. We don't mean like we speak that I'm relying upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where we'll engage in the world of form, we'll engage in the world of means, we'll engage in the world of causation. That's not what's meant in the truest sense by the world of tawakkul. The, what's the world of tawakkul and the wing of tawakkul is when the Prophet says, Let's took a hadikum. I'm not like any one of you. Although there may be some of you who draw, multemes, who are going to draw from my reality. What is that? Abit and the Rabbi. He says, I spend the night with my Lord. يُطْعِمُنِي وَيُسْقِينِي He's the one who feeds me. He's the one who nourishes me. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning, the Prophet doesn't have to engage the means whatsoever. 
because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takaffal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken it upon himself to look after his beloved sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahibi wa in an uncanny way. Tayyib. Uh, and so this is the maqam of zuhud. Again, an issue that Imam Abu Sayyidi is showing us, if you want to be true Muhammadans, true praise of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi we have to be people who reject the world, reject it, place the world aside. Otherwise, we fall into the, into the disease that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi of Abu Dawood promised would manifest inside of the heart of his Ummah at the end of time. Wahan. Wamel wahan, Ya Rasulullah. What is wahan, O Messenger of Allah? Hubbid dunya. He said, the love of the world. Wa karahiyya til mawt. An aversion to dying. An aversion to death. Wa rawadethu al-jibalu shumma min dhahabin an nafsihi fa araha ayya ma shamami. High mountain sought to tempt him by turning to gold. But he showed them lofty height upon height. And, and he, not tempt him in a negative way. I mean, they desire his love. Everybody desires for the Rasul wasallam, to turn towards them. Yeah, to embrace them. That's the nature of the mountains of Mecca. The mountains of Mecca, when the Prophet stands upon the mountains of Mecca with his companions like Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, like Umar ibn al-Qattab, like Sayyidina Zubayr ibn Awam, like Sayyidina um, Uthman ibn Affan, like Ali ibn Abi Talib, who were around the Prophet sallallahu when he stood, Talha ibn Ubaidillah, when he stood upon the mountains of Mecca, the mountains of Mecca began to shake and shudder. Likewise, when he stood upon the mounts of Medina to Munawwar Uhud, they begin to shake and shudder. Why are they shaking and shuddering? Because of their love of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He would tell us that himself. And Uhud, Jabal, Uhud is a mountain. And Yuhibbuna wa Nuhibboon. And Uhud is a mountain that loves us and we love it. And there's a love affair between us and Uhud. And so the mountains of Mecca desire to, to tempt. And the word, Riwad, Rawadathu Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is like to seduce. Are they trying to, yani, to facilitate love of the Prophet ﷺ towards them. How? By turning into gold, by turning into silver, by turning into emeralds. And the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam. And the Prophet ﷺ refuses that. In, in the tradition of Jibreel alayhi salam, that the Prophet ﷺ was promised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the mountains, wherever he moved, the mountains would move alongside him. Yaseer Hayfu Sahr. Yani, wherever he would go, the mountains would move alongside the Prophet. They transmuted themselves into gold and silver and precious realities. Yet the Prophet refuses. And then Yana Abd, he said, I'm a slave. That's what he desires. True slavehood in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why he's Muhammad. I'll be hungry a day and I will be satiated, quote unquote, a day. And I will live as my Lord provides for me. Sallallahu alayhi wa sahibu sallama. Wa rawadathu al-jibalu shumma min dhahabin an nafsihi. Fa araha iya ma shamami. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam showed them what is loftiness. What is the reality? Wa akkadat zuhdahu fiha daruratuhu inna darurata la ta'adu an al-isami. His constraint through poverty only confirmed his detachment from them. That his constraint through poverty only confirmed his detachment from them, and from the world. A need such as his shall not lead to transgression. Zero inclination towards the world, the Prophet ﷺ. And so when you look into his life, that the Prophet ﷺ, he lived a life that was abject, that there was no world inside of his life, ﷺ. And if you went into the private quarters of the house of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you would have to cry. And you would cry tears out of your eyes. Like in Hadith of Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab in al-Bukhari. When he goes into the private quarters and sees how the Prophet actually lives, he begins to cry Ibn al-Khattab. And look at the Prophet Sassim's words to Sayyidina Umar. Ma yubkika ya Ibn al-Khattab. What is it that makes you cry, O son of al-Khattab? Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab said, I've seen and the people of the world. The kings of the world. See, you know, Umar in Jahiliya was an ambassador for Quraysh. He saw how the kings of the world lived. And Sayyidina you know, Umar said, Umar Warda said, You are the messenger of God. <laughs> and if anybody deserves to live that way, it's you. And the Prophet says, Ya Ibn al Khattab, O son of Khattab, are you not content? That they have the dunya. 
and we have the next will. I'm not content here, Ibn al-Khattab. Hakab ibn Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But note that the quote-unquote poverty of the Prophet sallallahu the poverty of the Prophet sallallahu was ikhtiyaran lakhtiraran, the ulama say. It was out of choice. Okay? Not because he was compelled or forced. It wasn't environmental that he had no other options. As we said, the entire mountains were offered to him as gold and silver. But he rejected it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Maqam of zuhr, maqam of abstinence and renunciation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of the great imams of the religion, Imam Subki, rahimahullah ta'ala, and Imam Tajuddin al-Subki, and then his father, Taqiyuddin al-Subki, imams of the 8th century of Islam in Cairo, Egypt, and Damascus. Imam Taj, who is the son, used to say about his father, Taqiyuddin al-Subki, rahimahullah ta'ala, that when he was in a daras teaching about the Prophet Sallallahu reality, he said, if anybody said that the Prophet Sallallahu was poor, and what they meant by poor, that yani, environment made him that way, Sallallahu was poor, we would have to restrain, physically restrain my father from beating the person up. He just wanted to attack the person just for using that word about the Prophet Sallallahu He said, we, we have to physically restrain my father from actually attacking the person, you know, accusing the Prophet Sallallahu of a type of negative poverty. Because somebody who's poor because of environment, they're slaves to the world. Okay? It's the world that has placed them inside of a vice grip. And the reality of the way of the Prophet Sallallahu is true liberation from the world Sallallahu This is a choice that he made. And that's why Imam Busayri is saying he's constrained through poverty, only confirmed his detaching from them. A need such as his shall not lead to transgression. Why? Because it has no, it doesn't have an iota of love or desire for the world whatsoever. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alayhi wa and the love of the world and the inclination towards the world is the root of all evil. وَكَيْفَ تَدْعُوا لَدُنْيَا دَرُورَةُ مَنْ لَوْ لَاهُ لَمْ تُخْرَجِ الدُّنْيَا مِنَ الْعَدَمِ How could poverty tempt him to worldliness? When but for him, the world would not have been brought from the void. But it's only by virtue of the Prophet that the world exists. And that is the creed, the doctrine of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. In tradition, the hadith of Sayyidina Jabir, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, a hadith that related to the Qalam, a hadith in Tabaran of Sayyidina Adam, alayhi salam, yani different realities. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarifies, وَلَوْلَاهُ مَا خَلَقَتُكَ Were enough for him, Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I would not have created you. No loh, no qalam, nothing would have been created if it was not for the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so how can the far'a tempt the asr? How can the child tempt the parent? Can't. Prophet Sallallahu is one who is absolutely bereft of any inclination towards the world in and of itself and that's one of the reasons why he's praised Sallallahu Alaihi The name Muhammad, which is part of our discussion, the name Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi it means the one who kathira khisalu al-hamida It's the one who has an overabundance of praiseworthy qualities That's why he's the object of intense praise Yani you, you cannot, yani, when to do ni'mat Allah, la tuhsuha. If you try to enumerate the ni'mat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the blessing of Allah ta'ala, as the surah al-ra'ad, la tuhsuha. You can't. Tustari rahimahullah ta'ala said the blessing of Allah is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa wa sallam. And now what we're asking here, try to enumerate its praise, praiseworthy qualities. How many praiseworthy qualities did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi have such that you can do justice to his, to praise of him sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallam. That's why Muhammadun Sayyidul Kawnaini wa Thaqalaini wa Al-Fariqaini min Urbin wa min Ajami Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Muhammad Al-Bakhil Min Dhukirtu Indahu wa Lam Yusalli Alayhi Kalam Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam The Maiza Definition of the Maiza Of people who are stingy uh, Is the one who hears my name mentioned Wa Lam Yusalli Alayya It doesn't say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
Anytime you hear his name, no matter whether you hear his name, Muhammad sallallahu wa sallam, or you hear his name, Ahmed sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or you hear his name, Abu Qasim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or ya ayyuhal mudathir sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or ya ayyuhal mudathir sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or ya ayyuhal muzammil sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or taha sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or yasin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, qulu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, say sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, wa sallam, really important that your tongue is moist, in the dhikr of the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. And it's shof, you'll hear people who say, Muhammad. And then they go silent. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. That's a dead heart. It's just that they have a dead and a still tongue. The tongue should never be still whenever the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sahi wa sallam, is mentioned. Because it's speaking about his midh. And in you mentioning him and praising him, you're still not doing him justice. It's just from his ni'am. Allah asbagha alayhi, that the blessing that Allah Ta'ala drapes the Prophet in, in, that it now overflows onto you, ayyuh al-abd, O slave, overflows onto you. Yani, mashallah, tabarakallah. And it's, men salla alayya marra, the one who gives salawat upon me once, sallallahu alayhi ashara. Allah, yes, I said Allah sends salawat upon you ten times. He said, what, bakhil? Somebody doesn't desire salawat min Allah. You don't desire salawat from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Salawat min, min Allah ta'ala rahmah is mercy from the divine. وَلَا تَدْخُلُوا جَنَّ بِعْمَالِكُمْ You will not enter paradise through your deeds. إِلَّا يَتَغَمَّدَنِ اللَّهُ بِرَحْمَتِهِ وَفَضْلِهِ Except if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala embraces me, drapes me in his mercy and grace. Shuf, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahihi wa sallama. If that's all you did for the rest of your life, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. That's all you did. Invoke praises, salawat upon the Prophet I mean, look how easy it is. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's like la ilaha illallah. It's all upon the tip of your tongue. It doesn't need the athletic mouth of the Arabs for you to pronounce that beautiful statement. And if you're, quote unquote, you're too busy with other things inside of your dunya, Sallallahu alayhi wa Sallallahu alayhi, sallallahu alayhi, look how easy that is. Allahumma salli alayhi, Allahumma salli alayhi, Allahumma salli alayhi. You haven't got a clue what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing to you at that point in time. Man salli alayhi ashara, the one who says it ten times upon me, sallallahu alayhi, yeah. Allah does it a hundred times. Don't look at the hundred, just look at Allah, the divine. You keep your eye on the prize. Man sallallahu alayhi, yeah. The one who sends salawat upon me a hundred times, sallallahu alayhi wa alf, Allah will embrace him in one thousand min Allah. Salawat from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Men salla alayya alf, and the one who sends salawat upon me a thousand times, will rub shoulders with me upon the doors of paradise. Karam of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahihi wa sallam. This is Muhammadun Sayyidun. And Muhammad is a Sayyid. And those two names have an element of, of, yani, of similar signification. This as we said that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of its meanings is the one kathir al is the one who has an overabundance of praiseworthy qualities. Likewise, look at the definition of the Sayyid. What is a Sayyid? The one who has an overabundance of praiseworthy qualities. So Muhammad is the Sayyid sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallam. Shuf, we have people in our day and age say that you can't call him the Sayyid. You can't say Sayyiduna. <laughs> Subhanallah. that you can't call the Prophet a Sayyid. Ah, that's why they say, I mean, what's your delay for calling him a Sayyid? What's your delay for calling yourself John? I want to know. <laughs> ah, I mean, what's your delay for the name that you carry? And the titles that you employ, show me your delil in that regard. And if the delil of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is Sahih Muslim, is not sufficient for you. And the Sayyidu Waladi Adam Wala Fakhar. I am the Sayyid of the offspring of Adam Wala Fakhar. And in case you think that it excludes Adam, and the Sayyidu Nas Wala Fakhar in a riwayah. I am the Sayyid of humanity Wala Fakhar. He is the Sayyid Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Upon count number one, his qualities over abundant of praiseworthy quality. That's a Sayyid. Number two, the one who you flee to, and the shada'i, definition number two of the sayyid. When the matter gets dire, who do you seek refuge behind? Kalama Sayyidina Anas, Kalama Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib, Kalama Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al-Khattab, 
when a god died in the midst of war we would take shelter behind the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi that's the sayyid ah araftum and then the third meaning of the sayyid man kathura yani the one junud the one who has an abundance of armies of followers of those who would die to preserve his life sallallahu alaihi wasallam and who has armies like muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam and sure if we give you a secret the name of the prophet sallallahu alaihi muhammad it's a secret of umm busairi muhammadun sayyid al qawnain that name muhammad you should never utter it qillat al adab to say the name muhammad by the name muhammad you need you mean the name muhammad bad adab show me where the companions called him muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa sahbihi wa sallam there's only two types of people who can utter that name one gabriel can utter it Ya Muhammad, like in the hadith of Jibreel. The others are the A'rab, ashaddu kufran wa nifaq, as Allah Ta'ala says. Are those Badu, those people who are the most extreme in disbelief and hypocrisy. So they say the name Muhammad, you should never ever utter it. But when you use Muhammad, you mean the one who has an overabundance of praiseworthy qualities. You mean the sifa, the attribute. You don't mean the name. It's a difference. Araftum. And so that's like Busayri here. When he says Muhammadun, he doesn't mean the name. That's not what he's speaking about, Muhammad, the name. He has too much adab with the Prophet to utter the name of the Prophet ﷺ in that way. But he means that which that name, quote unquote, signifies. The attribute, the qualities of that great one, Sayyid al Kawnaini wa Faqalain. And Siyada, yani this Siyada or mastery, is afforded to anybody who attaches to the Prophet. ﷺ. And the supreme siyada is for Ahlul Bayt. And the family of the Prophet ﷺ. In Ibn Hadha la Sayyid, as in the Hadith al-Bukhari of Sayyidina Hassan. The verily this son of mine is a Sayyid. Son of mine, Hassan. Uh, the grandson of the Prophet ﷺ. But look, for proximity, the Prophet ﷺ said, In Ibn Hadha, this son of mine. He didn't say, In Sibulti Hadha, the grandson of mine, the maternal grandson. He didn't say that. In Ibn Hadha, the son of mine. Why? That proximity. Let's say again, he is a master by virtue of me being a master. Sayyid al Qawni. Sayyida Hassan al Hussein in the Riwayah. Sayyida Shabab al Jannah. The Hassan al Hussein, they are the Sayyids, the masters of the youth of paradise. And all of the people of paradise are you. Huh? But likewise, us, as we sort of strive, and toil and struggle to attain proximity to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wa Sahi Wa Sallam we pray that Allah wa Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala allows us to attach to those people who had profound and deep love for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Sallam those people who understood the pathways in the depths of the night those people who understood the pathways inside of the what? the depths the dungeons of the dunya in and of itself the likes of Sayyidina Salman al Farisi, as we see inside of Khandaq one of those times where the Prophet ﷺ is what is tying stones to his stomach, as Imam Busayri Rahimullah Ta'ala just informs us. And he's saying, Anas radiallahu anhu wa said we would go and sit with the Prophet ﷺ, and there is some speaking to his companions, but he has a stone tied to his stomach. Hakada. A stone tied to his stomach. In Al Bukhari وسلم, at the Battle of Khandaq, when some of the companions, due to intense hunger, are showing the Rasul, look, it's difficult. Look. Prophet says, three days, three days, didn't eat anything at the Battle of Khandaq, not a lukma, not a drop of food at the Battle, at the battle of Khandaq. And Sahaba is showing them, the, the Prophet says, their stomach with a stone tied. And the Prophet says, reveals his stomach and he has two stones tied, sallallahu alayhi wa never wait. Medicine of the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi Nature of hunger inside of your digestive tract, it's harara, it's heat. The nature of the stones, it's coolness. And so the minerals inside of the stones, they offset the heat that is produced by the stomach. That's what the Prophet is showing us. Hakada the Prophet was. But that great being, Sayyidina Salaman al Farisi, Rahimullah Ta'ala, when he's of those who's being quick in obeying the commandment of the Prophet, moving swiftly to the commandment, in digging the trench. Rafd. And so the Prophet begins to apportion the companions, those from Mecca, those from Medina, and they all begin to dig the trench. Because now the forces, the Ahzab, the Confederacy Army is approaching Medina, 10,000 strong. You have to build the defense mechanism before they arrive. And so, khalas, no time to waste. 
And what the Sahaba begin to notice is that the fastest digger, the swiftest to the commandment is Sayyidina Salman al-Farisi, Rahimullah Ta'ala. And from the bewildered things of this great Imam Salman al-Farisi, Rahimullah Ta'ala, he's like over 300 years of age at this point in time. As Ibn Hajar Asqalani tells inside the Isaba, he says Salman al-Farisi died at 350 years of age. When he died. Okay, sure. He brings even a riwayah that some even believe Salman al-Farisi was from the disciples of Jesus. He was Mu'ammar, radiallahu anhu warda. The Sahaba then begin to, they want Salman upon side. The people of Mecca, the Muhajirun, yeah, Salman, come to our side. Dig with us. Yeah. Oh, because everyone wants to please the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa yeah. Salman, minna, Muhajirin. Salman's one of us, he's Muhajir, not from Medina. He migrated like the rest of us. The people of Medina, la, 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 Salman, minna. Al-Ansar, Ma'ashat al-Ansar. Salman's one of us. And he was in Riq, he was, he was in slavery to a Jew, so khalas. The Mawla, yani the, the, the freed slave, follows what? The quote-unquote, the former master. He's one of the people of Medina. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi overhears and the argument, and then the Prophet Sallallahu gives a great bishara, not to Salman al-Farisi alone, but to each and every single one of us. Salman minna ahl al-bayt. Salman is one of us, the people of the house, in ahl al-bayt. Uh, so thereby, the Prophet opens up a door for each and every single one of us, even if our blood is devoid of the blood of the Prophet Sallallahu that our hearts will pump his blood will be attached to his reality, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And that, at that point, you become of those Sayyids. The dunya wal akhirah. A master inside of this world and the next. He's the Sayyid al Kaunain. He's the master of the Kaunain, of the two worlds. Whether the two worlds are this world and the next world. A dunya wal akhirah. Whether the two worlds are the khalq and the amar. The, the, these two polar opposites of the world in which we're in. The world of dimension and the world of no dimension, non loci. He's the master of it, of all of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wathaqalaini, he's the master of the two heavy realities. Whether in the real, in, in like in Surah Al-Rahman, the two heavy realities are the sprite and the humans, jinn and humans. Or whether in the tradition inside of the Sahih, that the one, that the, the two heavy realities that the Prophet sallallahu said, is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whatever, he's the master of the Kaunain, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he's the master of the Faqalain, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wal fariqaini min urbin wa min ajami. And he's the master of the Arabs, and he's the master of the non-Arabs, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallam. He is the master, the Sayyid, in Taha al-Amr. And a Sayyid of Waladi Adam, wala faqar. I'm the master of the progeny of Adam, and I'm not boasting. And if I wave to boast, there'd be no boast like this boast. That's Izni Abdul Salam and others say. He's not saying that I'm not boasting, he's saying, and there's no boast like this boast. Wala fakhra. Kahadi al fakh. That there's no fakhr like this fakh. Izni Abdul Salam says. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. Nabiyuna al amiru nahi fala ahadu na barra fi kawli la minu wa la naami. Our Prophet who commands and forbids. There is no more faithful to his word, whether yes or no. Can you imagine that? SubhanAllah. That there's not a single thing that the Prophet commanded to, save that he did it. And not only did he do it, he did it first. I mean, that's mashallah tabarakallah. Because ordinarily, there's a disparity, a dichotomy between the word of a man and the deeds of a man. That, that's sort of normal. And you're going to struggle to find ulama, ulama, awliya, who everything they've commanded to, that they've also did. You're going to struggle to find that. And that's, yani, ilmihim. That's in the context of the constriction of the knowledge of the ulama, in relation to the vastness of the knowledge of the Prophet But there's not a single thing that he commanded to, save that he did it. Who did he command, sallallahu He commanded the angels. Who did he command, sallallahu alayhi Because he was sent to the angels. Araf. Who did he command, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He commanded the jinn, the jinn, because he was sent to the jinn. Who did he command, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He commanded human beings, because he was sent to human beings. Who did he command, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Animals, because he was sent to animals, sent to plant life, sent to minerals, sent to inanimate object. And there's not a single thing he commanded, save that he also did it, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallam. Yani, yani, bewildered you will be. In the next episode of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam.
That's what Busayr is leading goes to. That the Prophet وسلم, the greatest sign that he is Abdullah, the slave of God, of the meanings of Allah, is the bewilderer, is that he is bewildering Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's the greatest signs of who he is. Never did he say yes, save that he manifested the yes. Never did he say no, and that was a rarity in his life. Like, like Al-Farazdaq says about Zayn al-Abidin, he says, ما قال الله إلا في التشهودي That he never said la except when he said la ilaha illallah. Ah, and that's Zayn al-Abidin, the great grandson of the Prophet That's the great grandson. <laughs> what about the great grandfather? Huh? That's what Sayyidina Anas radiallahu anhu warda says. That's what Sayyidina Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu warda says. And he, a jiller of the companions. And Zayd ibn Thabit when he was asked about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi being the neighbor of the Rasul. Tell me about his character. And the Prophet and he said that the Prophet sallallahu what can I tell you about his character? I was his neighbor and never was he asked something such that he would reply, la. That would never happen. Nobody could ever ask of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi something and he would say, la, no. It just like wasn't in his vernacular. Sayyidina Anas radiallahu anhu wa said once a man asked him for money and he wants some charity. And the Prophet وسلم, gave him the wealth that existed between two mountains. Like, like, like livestock upon life. You, you, you just want something you see it. Ah, like one of them say, he said, why do you give him so much? Like one of them said to the Prophet وسلم, why do you give him so much? Because the nature of the Bedou, of Bedouin simple people, the smallest amount they're happy. People ask in accordance to their desire, and people give in accordance to their desire. Raftum, Aka the Sir and Nabu, secrets of the Prophet Sallallahu He is the loved one whose intercession is hoped for, a victor against every terror and calamity. Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi wa Sahih wa Sallam. Huwal Habib, as we mentioned before, the word Habib in the Arabic language, like what they call wasn't al Fa'il, the word Fa'il in the Arabic language, it can mean Fa'il or it can mean Maf'ul. It can be both or sometimes it can be either or. What do mean Fa'il or Maf'ul here? The word Habib can mean the one who loves or the one who's loved. It can mean both. Here translated, he is the loved one. It's translated as the Mahboob. But it also carries the signification of the one who loves. He is the most profound lover of the divine. Of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, but what Busayri wants from us is for the Prophet sallallahu to be rendered the object of our love. Because when he's the object of our love, then we want to be united with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when you, want, when you want to be united with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you want to see him. You want to be with him. You want to visit him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look at Kalam al Rasul. Man zara qabri wajrabat lahu shafa'ati yawm al qiyamah. It's an example of a hadith. The one who visits my grave, my residence, then my intercession is wajib, obligatory for them upon the day of judgment. That's what he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's the golden grail of the universe. Shafa'at al Rasulillah. The intercession of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he's the Habib, the loved one whose intercession is hoped for. You hope for it, but how then are you going to expose yourself to the shafa'at of the Prophet And he has multiple shafa'at, multiple degrees of, of intercession. Some of them, min khususiyatihi, are only for him. Some of them, Allah Ta'ala, through him, extends it to other aspects of his creation, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the greatest intercession of the Prophet is the maqam al-mahmood. Ah, that maqam al-mahmood, the praiseworthy station, that's in Surah Al-Isra. And that maqam al-mahmood that relates yani, to tahajjul. Zalam to sunnata man ahya zalama, the one who brings life to the night. Uh, this tahajjul. Wa min al-layli fa tahajjad bihi nafilatan laka. As Allah Ta'ala says, in the midst of the night, then bring the night to life through worship. Reject sleep. Nafilatan laka. As an act of devotion for you. Nafilatan doesn't mean fiqh nafila. Because the ulama generally agree that the nafila for the Prophet Sallallahu here means wajib. This is an obligation for you to perform, to pray in the midst of the night. Asa yab'athuka rabbuka maqaman mahmooda. In the hope that your Lord will raise you upon the praiseworthy station. What's the praiseworthy station? Shafa'at al udma That is the supreme intercession of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi where he intercedes on behalf of all of creation. Just for what? 
judgment to begin. And what an intercession. If the least we extrapolated from that is that standing upon the Yom Al-Qiyamah is in excess of 55,000 years. You stand upon the day of judgment. And then the Prophet informed us that there are people at that point in time who desire hell over the continuation of standing Yom Al-Qiyamah. They desire hell any place put here. Excess of 55,000 years. That when the Prophet intercedes, Ya Muhammad, as Allah Ta'ala says, Oh Muhammad, irfa ra'sak, raise your head. Why raise his head? Because he's in prostration to the divine. Tufta alayya al Muhammad, he says in Bukhari and Muslim, he says, ways of praising Allah are inspired in me. Lem tuftah li ahadin min qabli. That have never been inspired in anybody prior to me. And I praise and I praise. And every time he praises, it's a different manifestation of praise. Until he hears those beautiful words of the divine, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Irfa' ra'sak, ya Muhammad. Oh Muhammad, raise your head. Sal tu'ta. Look at that license to ask. Ask and you'll be granted whatever you ask. Shafi' to shafi'. Intercede and your intercession is duly accepted. And then the first words of the Prophet Sallallahu let judgment begin. That's why judgment begins. But look, from 55,000 years and counting, judgment is done and dusted. Angels are judged. It's issue of recompense for angels, Yawm Al-Qiyamah. It all goes good for angels. لا يعصون Allah. They don't disobey Allah Ta'ala. All human beings are judged. Yani, jinn are judged. Yani, even animals are judged that the Prophet Sallallahu told us, Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And everybody is judged, done and dusted, 24 hours. How do you account for that? If that's the least you understood from the intercession of the Prophet then that's a profound understanding of how he intercedes and makes things easier, even for people who are in difficult and dire situations, Then he also has a shafa'a, the second supreme shafa'a is for the supreme members of his ummah, in the hadith al-Bukhari and others, like the hadith of Sayyidina Ukash ibn Muhsin. Of the 70,000 people who entered into paradise without any type of reckoning. Not only no reckoning, but no prior punishment. Nothing. They entered into paradise. Even more than that, those 70,000, they draw from his light. Such that Allah Ta'ala, through the Prophet Sallallahu grants each one of those 70,000 the ability to intercede on behalf of 70,000 who likewise have no prior punishment or no prior reckoning whatsoever. From the intercessions of the Rasul, the third of the intercessions, are people at Fasl al Qada, at judgment, khalas, the stoja of Allahum al They're going to be sent to hell. And the Prophet, وسلم, I remain standing out of fear, my ummah will be sent to hell. And the Prophet, وسلم, when he takes the ledger from Malik, Khazanat al Nar, the guardian of hell, what does Malik say to the Prophet, وسلم, Ya Muhammad, O oh Muhammad, do you leave nobody for the wrath of your Lord? And one by one, who's in hellfire, he intercedes on behalf of them one by one, sallallahu alayhi And from his intercession, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa sallam, are those people, khalas, paradise, rifa'a fi darajat. Allah Ta'ala places them in a degree in paradise. The Prophet wants everybody with him. Folk, that's what he desires, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's why nobody asks, murafaqa, laka dhak. Nobody asks for his companionship in paradise, say that he would say, laka dhak. That is yours, that is yours, that is yours. فَقَدْ عِنَّ عَلَيَّ Just assist me in the world. بِكَثْرِتِ sujood With a lot of praise, a lot of prostration to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَكِنْ لَكَ ذَاكَ But it's yours. Why? Because خَلَاس You for you and me for me. Arafdum, it's not that you want to be with me. That's a degree. But more so, he wants us to be with him. That's the love. Of the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's the, compa- the, the, the compassion that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, harisun alaykum, as Allah ta'ala says. He is like, yani, he is eager yani, yani, for the believers to be in his good company. Because anybody in his company is saved by the blessings of him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. From his shafa'a, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is even people who are in the midst of hell. Who have eternality in hell, that from the shafa'a of the Rasul, وسلم, their punishment in hell will be lightened. Like in Hadith al Bukhari of Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab, whose punishment is lightened inside of hell. Why? 
not just because this is the way of Abu Lahab, Araft. Not just the way of Abu Lahab. In that in Al Bukhari, Abu Lahab tells his brother uh, Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib that what I was warned every Monday, Allah Taala allows me to suck between here and here, that what which comes out like milk, so that it relieves me of the punishment I am experiencing inside of hell, the worst type of punishment. Why? Because of the day that Muhammad was born. Farih. I was so happy. Eh? Look, shuf, and tomorrow, inshallah ta'ala, Rabi al awwal enters. Which one of us yeah, are going to sleep tonight eh? in anticipation of the great month? Eh? Which one of us will get a good night's sleep? Which one of us are going to have a restless night because, subhanallah, the great sort of guest that comes through the Prophet وسلم, is now approaching? The month in which we can take quantum leaps towards Allah Ta'ala and His Prophet وسلم, through praise of Him. Through remembrance of him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Through remembrance of the day he was born, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Through remembrance of the day he took flight unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Through remembrance of his hijrah, of his migration from Mecca to Medina, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Through imitation of him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Which, huh? Which one of us is going to have a restless night, a sleepless night? Which one of us? Sha'n al muhib hakada. That's the affair of the one who's truly in love with the Prophet. Is tonight is not a night of sleep, huh? Tonight is a night of anticipation, of embracing the great month that is approaching each and every single one of us. It's one of those months, maqbool, that is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will embed you in the company of the Prophet himself, embed you in his company. Abd al Abidin Sarmad al Samidi, forever inside of his company. Great sort of litmus test for the people who are people of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, or people who just claim to be the people of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. From his shafa'a, from his shafa'a sallallahu alaihi wasallam, is anybody who, who asks Allah to give him sallallahu alaihi wasallam a qam al mahmud after the adhan. From his shafa'a sallallahu alaihi wasallam is ahl al bakir, his shafa'a for ahl al bakir. From his shafa'a sallallahu alaihi wasallam is anybody who dies inside of the haramain. Mecca and Medina. Anybody in Mecca and Medina, they enter inside of the shafa'at of the Prophet From his shafa'at is the people of Kaba'ir. That my shafa'at, my intercession, has been reserved li ahlil kaba'ir min ummati for the people of major sins from my nation. You know, the killers and the drug dealers and the alcoholics and the liars and the fornicators. Hadola, those folk. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. Yani what type of yani religion? Everyone understands, so be careful how you understand what I'm saying. But what type of religion can it, from a perspective, be good to be a killer? From a perspective. Can it be good to be a fornicator? Can it be good to be an alcoholic? Can it be good to be a liar? And what type of religion is that a religion of mercy that comes forth from a being of mercy, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? When he reserves his shafa'i, his intercession, for such folk, the worst type of folk upon the face of the planet, inside the Ummatul Muhammadiyah, the Prophet has their back. And if he has their back, وسلم, what about the rest who are beyond them in terms of reality and degree? We ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to be shakur. People who are really grateful for this Prophet that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gifted. Because subhanAllah, sometimes you think, subhanAllah, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send him to us? And a personalized relationship. And not why wasn't the Prophet وسلم, sent before Adam or before Nuh or before Ibrahim or before Musa? Don't look at it from that perspective. But why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala designate in pre-eternity for you to be born when you were born? Inside of his era, inside of his nation. It's just that your Prophet is him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What then do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quote unquote thinks of you? Subhanallah, what type of Lord do we have? That he would send the Prophet to you, to me. You know, subhanallah, if you had knock knock upon the door and the door was open and you looked up and out and it was saying Adam alayhi salam, you'd be like, mashallah, Adam has come and knocked upon my door. Or if he was saying Ibrahim or Musa or Isa ibn Maryam alayhi salam. And he'd be like, MashaAllah, Jesus knocking upon my door. What about when it's Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa knocking upon your door? 
And then he comes into your house and he tells you how to dress. And he comes into your house and he tells you how to eat. And he comes into your house and he tells you how to go to the bathroom. And he comes into your house and tells you how to sleep. And he begins to arrange your furniture or lack thereof. And he begins to arrange your dunya and lack thereof. Then he shows you how to worship, mashallah, tabarakallah. How to stand, how to bow, how to prostrate, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then he shows you how to remember Allah. Then he shows you how to remember him. And then he shows you the keys to paradise that are inside of his hand, inside of Sahih Muslim. I mean, what type of blessed being are you? By virtue of the blessed being that has been sent to you. We ask Allah Ta'ala for idraq, that Allah Ta'ala allows us to realize the reality. Huh? Because as Muslims, subhanAllah, by and large, we've sort of forgot in a deep state of heedlessness about the favor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed. Uh, which one of the favors of your Lord will you deny? Look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recites the entire Surah Al-Rahman to the Sahaba, Sahaba of Adab with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Sahaba, the Sahaba rose silent when he recites Surah Al-Rahman. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, you're not like your brothers from the jinn. You're not like your brothers from the jinn. The Prophet ﷺ said, every time when I recited Surah Al-Rahman to them, every time I recited the verse, which one of the two favors of your Lord will you deny? That they said, we deny none of the favors of our Lord. The jinn would respond to that verse each and every single time. And so the question likewise resonates to our day and age. Which one of the favors of your Lord will you deny? Uh, and the supreme favor, will you deny him? To God was his call, and those who hold fast to him hold fast to a rope that shall never break. In his form and his qualities, he excelled the other prophets. Their knowledge and nobility did not rival his own. And Faq sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Nabiyyin, as Allah, tilka rusul, as Allah ta'ala says, those are the messengers. Faddalna ba'aduhum ala ba'ad. That we have favored some over others. Those are the messengers. But we have favored some over others. Because you have sort of modernist Muslims, some modernist Muslims who are going to take a hadith of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam without taking the transmission of its understanding. Where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, La ala Yunus ibn Matta. That do not yani, favor me over Yunus, uh, Jonah, the son of Matthew, Yunus ibn Matta. Don't favor me over him. And so some of them are going to say, modern Muslims, that all of the prophets are the same. <laughs> no, no, the prophets are not the same. Not the same. That's Kalam Allah. That's the word of Allah. Tilka Rusul. They are the messengers. Faddalna ba'duhum ala ba'd. We are favored some over others. And the most favored without a doubt is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi Sahaba once were sitting. And they were sitting and they were discussing higher matters, mashallah. Look at the conversation of Sahaba. And the Sahaba ain't discussing football scores. Like many of us will sit there and discuss. Sahaba ain't sitting there and discussing, seeing as it's all brothers here, women. Like many of us will sit there and discuss. So however in discussing cuisine, you know what I mean? Or professions, or whatever it is that we lower ourselves to discuss. So Harbert and higher realities. See, in Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, they said we used to find Abu Bakr al-Siddiq in Khalwa, along with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, tawheed, to speak about tawheed, the oneness of the divine. Greater understandings of Allah subhanahu Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Sahaba in this instance are discussing the nature of prophecy. So they're discussing, look at the favor Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam. Bil khulla. And he made Ibrahim a khalil. MashaAllah. Look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala favored Sayyidina Musa with. He made Sayyidina Musa a khalim or a naji. Look at Allah ta'ala how he favored Sayyidina Isa ibn Maryam. Sahaba are discussing. He made him ruh. He made him kalima. He made him the spirit of God, made him the word of God. And then the Prophet وسلم, exits, exits, وسلم, approaches the Sahaba and says, Verily I hear that which he were discussing. Where was he to hear it? It was like he was amongst them. I remember the context for us. 
Don't raise your voice above the voice of the Prophet What does that mean to the companions? Speak gently, silent. Because the Prophet spoke very gently. Low voice, sallallahu alayhi So the Sahaba spoke in a very low tone, low voice. Yet still from the midst of his house, he is privy to what they're saying. Huh? Like uh, Abdullah ibn Rabay ibn, ibn, ibn Salul. On the miracles, Imam Bulsayri will show us of the reason we praise the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi the miracles, multiple miracles, numerous miracles he, came, he comes with. And he, he, Abdullah ibn Rabay ibn Salul, he's at uh, Hudaybiyah, and he sees the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they have no water just before Asr. They have no water. And so the Prophet summons Sayyidina Ali Sayyidina Imran ibn Talib, Sayyidina Umar ibn Hussain, to go and bring this woman in the midst of the desert. How does he know where she is? The Prophet tells them, Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib, Sayyidina Imran ibn Hussain, go to such and such a place in the midst of a desert, you will find a woman upon a mule, and she's carrying a utensil of water. Go and bring the woman to me. Ah, <laughs> And so the Shufa the Sahaba, they don't like, Ya Rasulullah, how do you know that? <laughs> because some of us, it might be like you're getting sent upon a wild goose chase. That's Allah salam al -afiyah. But look at the fiqr of the Sahaba and the Rasul. They go, they get to the exact place, there's the woman. Shown of as described by the Prophet sallallahu they bring the woman to the Messenger of Allah. He takes the utensil sallallahu alayhi wa khalas, places his hands in it, you just see water, yenba, water coming forth from his fingers. Here, coming forth from his fingers sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. See that water there? That water, the only water in the universe better than it, some say is kawthar. Some say not even kawthar. That that water there is the greatest water inside of the universe. Study it inside of the books when they try to discuss what's the supreme water. So the ulama generally, they converge upon the water that comes forth from his fingers. After that, kawthar. After that, zamzam. You have degrees of water. Look at the water coming forth from his fingers. And then everybody's taking, they're filling their utensils, they're making wudu. Can you imagine the moment? People are like, ha, ah, ah. ha. I just like you know, people. I mean, this is like this is the dunya and what it contains for them, the Sahaba, attaching to that which comes forth from him, and they all feel they made wudu, mashallah, tabarakallah, and then the Prophet them then seals the utensil and says to the woman, and yeah, this this is over a thousand people, it's not like one or two, a thousand people who make wudu, who drink, who fill all their water utensils. Then the Prophet tells the woman now leave, and then the Prophet commands the companions, you know, she was a good woman, so collect. What you have, bring it together and give it as a recompense. Look at how he gives the woman. And then he tells the woman, by Allah, we've taken nothing from you. You haven't taken a drop of water from you. Then St. Imran and Hussein says, and when I put the water back on, it was heavier than when I took it. Look how he left some of his spoils for here, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of the companions says to Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Sulul, the head of the munafiqoon of the hypocrites, he says, sure. He's at a great distance and look, now do you believe he's a prophet? Huh? Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, the Munafiq, he says, I've seen that before, yeah. I've seen that a hundred times, yeah. And yeah. That's what he says, huh? And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa at a distance, says, go and call me Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. So Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul is summoned, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he comes over to the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the Prophet sallallahu says to him, where have you seen that before? I'm like, where did he hear that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And so the Sahaba, radiallahu anhu, were down there speaking about Ibrahim, speaking about Musa, speaking about what? Isa ibn Maryam. And the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, says, Naam, yes, Ibrahim is Khalilullah. Yes, Moses is Najeeullah. Yes, Isa ibn Maryam, alayhi wa sallam, is Ruhullah wa Kalimato. He is the spirit of God and the word of Allah. Wa ana Habibullah. And I am the beloved of God. Faqan Nabiyin. And in that Mahabba, that Mahbubiya, khalas, way beyond all of the other prophets themselves. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Fi khalq, in his form, beyond them. Wa fi khuluk, in his attributes, beyond them. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In his attributes, beyond them. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His form is absolute perfection. His form is absolute perfection. All of the prophets are beautiful. All of the prophets are perfect. But the Prophet ﷺ is not only the most perfect of the perfect, but in every single moment he increases in perfection. Hekad in, in his form, Abdullah ibn Abbas said, Ma arsalallahu nabiyan qat illa hassan al-wuju. Allah Ta'ala has never sent a prophet save of perfect form. 
perfect form, the prophets, when they come. Mashallah, they're striking, stunning beings, the prophets themselves. But our prophet is something different. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahibu salama. So that as we learn, the khalas, the sahaba, ma tama'ana nadhar. They were unable to get off, you know, to fill their eyes with the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam due to the profound beauty that he had. One, but despite the fact that that beauty was veiled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you weren't seeing the real him. You're getting a partial glimpse at best of his reality sallallahu alayhi wa Other when it's expressed in words. By saying Ali ibn Abi Talib, look at the hadith, like Ali ibn Abi Talib, saying Bara ibn Azib, saying uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas, saying Abu Huraira, saying Abu Tufail, multiple companions. Ma ra'aytu qablahu wa la ba'dahu mithlahu. Ma ra'aytu qablahu wa la ba'dahu ahsanu minhu. Look at him, I've never seen anyone before or after him the like of him. Never seen anyone before or after him more beautiful than him. Never seen. Then the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as Wahibat al Zulaikha, Law Raina will let Atharna Qata al Fawadi al Aidi. As Aisha said, the companions of Zulaikha, had they seen him, they would have ripped out their hearts rather than slit their wrists. The beauty, profound beauty of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's in his khalq. Huh? His khalq, his form. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam liked beautiful form. He liked those with beautiful face, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Example from amongst his companions, the likes of whom say, Dihir al Kalbi. It's like to say in Urub ibn Mas'ud, a thaqafi, and it's beautiful in terms of their face. So the Dihya al Kalabi is the form of Gabriel. The Gabriel is so beautiful, Gabriel comes in his form. Dihya al Kalabi by face is so beautiful, they say when he walks through the streets of Medina, they say virgin women in shy Medina come out of their houses just to look at him. They've never seen the likes of Dihya al Kalabi. Beautiful, saying the Dihya al Kalabi. The likes of whom, saying the Urub ibn Mas'ud, a thaqafi. Looks just like Jesus. Facially, you see him, you think you're looking at Jesus. The Prophet ﷺ in Bukhari, he says, Sallallahu And Jesus, when the Prophet ﷺ in Bukhari sees Jesus, the Prophet ﷺ said, I've never seen a dark skinned man more beautiful than him. In Al Bukhari, the Prophet ﷺ says, More beautiful than him. Saying it, Isa ibn Maryam. And so, what was Sayyidina Urwa and Mas'ud al Faqafi? What was Sayyidina Dihya al Kalb? But then compare them to the Prophet ﷺ, not an iota of his beauty. Not one iota of his beauty. That's why women can propose to him in the street. In Shai Medina, they can propose to the Prophet ﷺ in the street. See, the Prophet ﷺ doesn't quote unquote, you know, for us men need to go on Facebook and like and put a pose in order to attract some attention. He doesn't need to do that, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. He is attention. I mean, the entire cosmos gravitates to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa wa sallam. I mean, every single day, the changing of the gods in the hadith of Suyuti, 70,000 angels are descending to his grave, all caressing his grave. Every single day, changing gods. Every day, 70,000, 70,000 brand new, 70,000 brand new. The whole cosmos attracted to the reality of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Believe me, as Busayr is coming to, this is not exaggeration. And it, this is exaggeration in the opposite direction. We are not doing him justice whatsoever, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He loved beautiful form. Like saying a Jareed ibn Abdullah al-Bajali, anhu wa becomes Muslim 30 days before the death of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Jareed ibn Abdullah al-Bajali. He was a man of perfect form, physical physique. Jareed anhu would say, never would the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, see me, say that he would smile. The smile at me, subhanallah. Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab understood why the Prophet was smiling. So after, after the flight of the Prophet وسلم, Umar ibn Khattab would summon Jareel al-Bajli, ibn Abdullah al-Bajli. And when Jareel would come to Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, Sayyidina Umar would say, Jarrid ya Jareel, strip off your top, strip it off. And so he'd strip off his top and then you could see his physique. And Umar ibn Khattab said, I smile at the one who the Prophet smiles at. I mean, the physical form. Of saying the Jareel was something to see, something to witness. Then Umar ibn Khattab would take his garment and throw it back to him and say, Now get dressed and leave. Khalas. I just wanted to follow the Sunnah that's smiling and looking at you, yeah, Jareel. But the form of Jareel was nothing like the form of the Prophet. Ahsan al Khalq. That's what saying Hindi bin Abi Hala says. He was a perfect and beautiful form. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallam. In his form and in his qualities, likewise in his khuluq. And his khuluq and all of the innate qualities that the Prophet has. As the Imam Radulullah alludes to some here, 
and he was over and above excelled the other prophets, their knowledge and nobility did not rival his own. In their knowledge, they never even rivaled him. Huh? The prophets have knowledge. SubhanAllah. Sayyidina Isa ibn Maryam, radiallahu anhu, Sayyidina Musa ibn Iran, in, in Surah Al Kahf and in the Hadith al Bukhari, when one of his students asks, Who is the most knowledgeable man upon earth? Moses can confidently say, I am. I'm the most knowledgeable man upon earth. And Allah Ta'ala reveals, No, you're not. There's another man. It's not necessarily that he has more knowledge than Musa, but he has different knowledge to Musa. That's why at the end of the hadith is Khidr alayhi salam. Khidr says to Moses, you drink from an ocean and I drink from a different ocean. Ocean here is synonymous with knowledge. And we draw it from different types of wells here. Moses and Khidr. One of the great imams who was formerly from the nation of Moses. And then come from the nation of the Prophet Because he understood the desire of Moses. Moses had a deep desire to be from the Ummah of the Prophet Traditions. And desire to be from this Ummah. Look what Allah Ta'ala gave you. Look what Allah Ta'ala gave us. Huh? That we're from his Ummah. The desire of Moses, the Musa we desire. And so there are those who move and from the nation of Moses to the nation of the Prophet Sallallahu From amongst them, one of the great Imams, his name is Wahhab ibn Munabbi. And Wahhab ibn Munabbi was a Habar. He was one of those rabbis from the Jews previously until he became Muslim. From the time of the Tabi'een, sat with the Sahaba, Wahhab ibn Munabbi. And he said, Qarat He said, I Qarat, I have read in 71 different books of the ancients. 71 different books of the ancients. I have read Wahhab ibn Munabbi said that the knowledge of the Prophet وسلم, in relation to the knowledge of the entire creation, the knowledge of the entire creation, that the knowledge of the Prophet وسلم, is similar to a grain of sand in relation to all of the grains of sand upon the face of the earth. If you gather the knowledge of the entire creation together, Wahhab ibn Munabbi, this is Tabi'i, this is the people who sat with the companion saying, if you gather the knowledge of all of creation together, the first and the last of them, the human and the sprite and the angel of them, together, that combined knowledge is just a grain of sand in relation to all of the other grains of sand upon the face of the earth, which is quote unquote synonymous to the knowledge of the Prophet. That's why Ibn Busayri, Faqa Nabiyyin, it's not just words of praise. These words are anchored in knowledge that come forth from the first generation. Faqa Nabiyyin, if he khalqin wa fi khuluqin, wa lam yudanuhu fi ilmin. Nobody comes close to him in knowledge. And he's saying uh, Abu Dhar al Khifari would say that a bird would flap its wings inside of the sky and the Prophet would begin to give us knowledge of the bird. Can you imagine what I have to say because of Nabuwara? Just there's a bird, you know, a bird's flying past starts telling you all about the bed, the reality of the bed. When was the bed born? When the bed going to die? What did the bed have for, for this dinner today? The Prophet will give you the whole nine about the bed, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's just a bed flying past. And he hasn't been sent to clarify the reality of beds. But he's been sent to clarify the reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wala huh? karam. And likewise, Karam, in terms of his generosity, nobody rivaled the Prophet Sallallahu Each of them seeking something of God's messenger. Handfuls from the sea or drops of the drizzle. I mean, just depending upon who you are, you're taken from the messenger of Allah. But at best, and these are the Prophets, what do they get? They get Gharfan min al A Gharf is this, you got a handful of water from the sea. And when you take your handful of water from the sea, it's not like you're, you're depleting the water of the sea or affecting the water of the sea. But that's maximum extent the prophets get from the knowledge of the Prophet. And others, Rashfan mina diami. Rashfan mina diami translated as drops of drizzle. Diam is sort of continual rain. It's not drizzle, but it's more so continual rain. And it's rains and rains and rains. And sometimes people inside of their houses, they may get a splash of that rain that is continually raining. That's all you get from the knowledge of the Prophet Sallallahu And it's between a splash and between a handful. But the rest is for him Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam. وَوَافِقُونَ لَلَيْهِ عِنْدَ حَدِّهِمِ مِنْ نُقْطَةِ الْعِلْمِ أَوْ مِنْ شَكْلَةِ الْحِكَمِ Before him do they stand respecting their limits. Nobody transgresses. Nobody has lack of etiquette in front of the Prophet Dots to his knowledge or vowel signs to his wisdom. 
That's all there. Huh? You dot to his knowledge. Or often dots. Like in the Arabic writing, you have dots. And all dots are the same. Or, or as he said, vowel signs to his wisdom. And we have sort of four vowel signs. Four permutation of vowel signs. That's it, five. Khalas. That's all we have. Options. As it relates to the Prophet of knowledge. Me for some people, they will help interpretate the reality of the Prophet and the Prophets themselves. That's all they do, help interpret some of his reality. But the reality of the language of the Arabs and the Prophet ﷺ, the Arabian Prophet ﷺ, his language when written had no dots and it had no vowel signs. And khalas didn't have that whatsoever. And so the Prophet just come with something additional that helps bring clarity to more so people who are illiterate to a degree about what the Prophet ﷺ came with. Don't believe that the Prophet, because he became he came last, وسلم, that his reality wasn't known prior to him, known and elucidated by the Prophets themselves. وسلم, I was the first created and the last sent. That's what he said. Tayyib, inshallah. Tayyib, I think we're gonna we're gonna finish there because we're on 41. And we've got another 18 lines. Huh? So inshallah. If anyone has any questions at this point, inshallah, I think it's good to stop on the 40 first line.